This is Inspiring Design, where unique innovators come together to share their knowledge, share their insight, and keep us up to date with the latest industry trends. And here's your host, Rashan Senanayak. What's up, listeners? I'm your host, Rashan Senanayaka. Welcome to a brand new episode of Inspiring Design Season 2. So Season 2 is all about the student's point of view, and today is no exception to that. We're design thinking our way through the education and design system, featuring students from all over Australia in various subject areas, disciplines, and stages in their education careers. So to kick things off today, I have here with me two very special guests, Angus Godwin and Alexis Harper. They're going to be talking about entering the industry, transitioning from tertiary into the working environment from a student's point of view. Angus is 24. He completed his bachelor's and master's at QUT. He took a year off in between his bachelor's and master's and currently working at Ferrier Baudet Architects and soon to be working in Germany. Alexis is also 24, completed her bachelor's and master's at QUT as well while working two part-time jobs. Impressive. She is currently working at Philip Smith Conville Architects and soon to join the team at Ferrier Baudet as well. So without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome to the show, guys. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you. Thanks, Rashan. We're excited to be here too. Can we start off with a little bit of background and your story? Angus? Sure. Um, I guess my story starts in the design world in high school where I did uh, graphics and that really drew my attention towards the built environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I did my bachelor at QUT, did a few exciting things along the way, uh, like going over to Europe on one of the study tours, being taught by Rashan in my final year was <laughs> definitely a highlight. Yep. <laughs> um, I took a year off after that. And you have to say that by the way, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'm obligated. <laughs> um, I took a year off after that between my bachelor and my master's. Um, worked at a couple of different practices at Fab Architects, um, Bureau Proverts, and then I did a little bit of work with the exhibition design team at Goma and worked on the lighting installation on the facade. Yep. Um, came back to QUT to do my master's one short, sweet year, thank goodness. Yep. <laughs> and I really, really enjoyed that. Um, did a couple of projects around southeast Queensland as well as going over to China and doing some urban morphologies with Professor Paul Sanders. Yep, that's pretty cool. What about you, Lexi? Uh, yeah, I also had a similar experience in high school. I started in graphics in grade 8 and worked all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, I had a real passion for it. I always thought I would actually be a graphic designer, but it wasn't until there was a small component in grade 11 where it was a bit of an architectural sort of um, field to go on to, but I had no idea what architecture was, like <laughs> absolutely no clue. I was asking my teacher and she's like, architecture, like you're designing architecture. I'm like, what do you mean? But um, wow. I learned to let you, yeah, so I finally did that assignment and actually I fell in love and that what made me decided to do architecture. So I started in 2013 for my bachelor's. And I was a very hard, dedicated worker and didn't really allow myself the time to actually branch out and um, discover what else is out there in the world. So that's probably my biggest regret now, not engaging fully in the university life and what the university had to offer. It wasn't probably until Masters mm -hmm. that I probably branched out a bit and even further now working at Philip Smith Conwell. So I'm really engaged in the atmosphere at the moment. and. Yeah, that's about me. Right. There you go. That's pretty good. And I think that's wise advice for any of the students listening as well to be engaged in that university lifestyle. It sounds a bit boring, sounds a bit cliche, but there's actually a lot of value in that. Now, before we kick things off about the topic for today, I want to understand a little bit more about yourselves and your topic of, I think, expertise. What were the um, minors and majors that you guys studied in uni? Well, I did two minors. Um, one unsuccessfully in industrial design. I took industrial design one and... Why un unsuccessful? <clears throat> it's quite tricky. It's okay. harder than I thought and not what I thought it would be about. So I did that first subject, scraped through the pass and then um, dropped that as a minor and just had three electives, mm -hmm. which was quite good. So I filled that up with landscape architecture subjects, which I loved. All of those are really, really interesting and I think very beneficial in architecture, particularly in small-based projects and residential, which is yep. what I've been working on 
since I started working in practice back in second year. Yeah. And my other minor was urban design, which is both applicable to small projects, but gives you a good insight into the way cities work, the way society works, and how that can apply to every single project, regardless of its scale. Yeah, so thinking high level. High level thinking, yeah. um, not just thinking about the single end user for the building, but thinking about how that project fits into the world. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Awesome. What about you, Alexis? Um, I started off um, doing Japanese at UQ. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> I, did, I did a year there, yeah. um, but I just found it just juggling a whole new language, which was architecture, and then the language of Japanese, like combining them two, I just found it way too overwhelming. Wow. Um, especially when the students there were studying the Japanese full time, and I was only working, uh, studying that one subject at a time. And I did Japanese while through high school and did really well at it, and still now I try and get back into it as a bit of a hobby. Um, but I ended up dropping Japanese in my second year and um, started doing landscape architecture as well as Angus. And I felt that, that in itself landscape architecture is quite difficult, completely different to architecture. People yeah. might think it's the same, but it's a completely different language. Um, I really did enjoy it, especially doing a couple of first year and second year subjects. Um, but I thought that I don't really think that it's it's quite important, like both of them. Yeah, definitely. And a, a bit of a throwback to one of the previous episodes, I spoke to this um, design prodigy from QUT, but he was actually working in Marvel, all the current movies, Aquaman and everything, and I was blown away by it. But the language, it's so different just being industrial design. Yeah. And same with landscape. The, the way you look at the actual problem in itself or the challenge, it's completely different. And it's, it's quite unique. I think that's one of the misconceptions people have. But uh, one of the things I wanted to commend you on was actually studying another language. That's It's apparently the best way to expand your brain because the language is actually stored in a, each language is stored in a different part of your brain. So if you if you know multiple languages, you're literally using different parts of your brain and it, it, that's amazing. So well done. Let's get into how you actually worked and entered the industry. What was your unique story of how you entered the, entered the company that you're working in now? I guess. Okay, I can start off. I mean, I have a few interesting stories about how I entered particular roles, mm -hmm. and all of them have been a little bit of luck as well as a little bit of self-made luck. Define luck. Uh, things that just happen out of the blue, but I, I'm, I'm a pretty big advocate of making your own luck, so mm -hmm. things don't just happen. They happen at random times because you've put the effort into either put yourself out there, um, talk to a lot of different people, so you put in a lot of people, a lot of effort as well is required, but generally things don't happen when you necessarily want them to, they just happen. And that's what's happened to me with almost every job I've had. Um, probably some of the key ones would be when I finished my bachelor, I started working for Fab Architects and... Um, in the city. That was your first job? That was my, well, it wasn't, my, it wasn't my first industry job. My first industry job was at Populous. And I worked there as a student, sort of casually, over about two years. I didn't do a lot of work there, but that came out of basically upselling a customer when I was working at Mitre 10. I yeah, right. He wanted some sandpaper and I sold him an orbital sander instead. Yep. And then he gave me his card and he said, oh, I'm Ralph Wheel, I'm one of the associates at Populous. Wow. When we were talking about architecture. And then he offered me a job. So you essentially didn't give him a resume or no, no. applying? No. <laughs> love it, love it. Cool. Yeah. And then with Fab, I just, you know, finished my bachelor, emailed 30, 40 different practices in Brisbane and they were the only ones who offered me a job, so I took it. Uh, great learning experience for two years, but during that time we had a bit of difficulty where some of our projects dropped out, so my um, director, Brant Harris, was really, really good and found me two other positions to do while he didn't have enough work for me. Mm -hmm. That was a two months ago at Bureau Proverts and the other um, piece of work was at Quagoma, mm -hmm. working on a light installation on the facade of it. So I got quite a wide range of experience in a number of different scales yeah. and different types of work early on. And I think that led to my current position at Ferrier Baudet, mm -hmm. where I've known Scott, the new director, for many years. And he needed someone who had a wide range of experience. So he got in contact with me and said, you're finishing your master's soon. Come trial it. 
for a few weeks in the middle of your masters, yep. maybe on holidays, and if it's a good match, we'll tee something up for the end. Yep. And ultimately it was, and I'm still there. Um, year on, really enjoying it. It's a great learning experience. Uh, yeah, so that's basically the stories of how I got the positions and entered the industry. It was about doing a lot of different things, continuously yep. learning from different opportunities. Yeah. It's really, really crucial. That's awesome. And um, and your director now, Scott, is a good friend of mine. Him and I study together. So, Scott, if you're listening, I think we'll, it's a bit long overdue. I think we need to have a coffee catch up. That's, <laughs> that's he loves his coffee. <laughs> he loves his coffee. <laughs> we did try to actually set up a, a coffee meeting a few months back, but it fell through. But uh, anyway, hopefully this will kick things off as well. But uh, yeah, what about you, Alexis? Uh, I actually started at Drilla Architects uh, back in 2016, and it was during my time where I decided to cut back on my subjects a bit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to give this a go. Like, I'll try it. I had a really low self confidence back in the day. Surprisingly, now I'm like, I'm all over the shop. <laughs> but um, I started there and I only I applied, and there was a bit of a flyer off going around uni. And I'm like, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Like, I don't think I'll get it. And I ended up getting it. And mm -hmm. I worked there for two years. and as a student casually while working at Coles as another part-time position, like five o'clock in the morning starts. I wow. was always up pretty early. Um, so that was really good and I learned a lot because Ray Joel, there, he's an incredible architect, being there, his firm's been there since the 1970s back then and he's got a great amount of experience and he had a few architects with great experience as well there as well and a lot of young ones that entered the architectural registration industry while working there. Mm -hmm. um, I was there for two years and then um, there was a bit of a slow in work so I was actually without work for three months this year and I managed to get a position back at Coles um, just working while I was like applying for jobs and it is a hard industry to get a job. I was constantly applying and it got quite exhausting and hits the heart a bit, but... Um, Do you remember the number of applications you put? I probably sent over 30. Wow. And I only got one interview at in Ipswich. Wow. So I was really going for it. I was really... I was, and it hurt, it hurt a bit, like, but it's hard. And you just have to keep trying, keep your spirits up. Otherwise, like, you end up just, like, leaving and get too disheartened. But as long as you keep that up and... I was managed because I've always been friends with Angus since first year. We've always been pretty close, and he had a, there was a position going up every day. So I started there. I did about uh, I was there for about a month and a half for three days a week, um, and then through networking, I went to the architectural centenary debate a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. and I met Faye Holmes and Andrew Holmes, who Andrew Holmes is a director of Philip Smith Conwell, mm -hmm. and they had massive projects coming up, and managed to get there. Full time for three months, and then I'll be back at Ferry Boat Day um, next month. So I just think it's all about who you know, networking, and that's a strong passion that I've learned that I'm really trying to get myself out there and get people to know who I am. Yeah, yeah. And there's a couple of things that came out of that. I think the fact that you had, what was it, 30 odd applications and then one interview. Would you recommend, or now that you've gone through that journey for students listening, how would you approach that process different? I would start networking first year. Okay, cool, good. Let's let's define the word networking. What we, do you mean by that? Well, there's so many events that every like so many industries in Brisbane offer up. Like there's, I'm trying to go to as many as possible, and I'm like going to maybe three or four a week, mm -hmm. and then sometimes I'll get back down again just to have a bit of a relax. But there's so many events that so many students can attend. It's after like normally at like six o'clock and in the city, so easily accessible. Yeah. And you meet, you learn about products, you meet uh, specifiers, you end up meeting other architects, and if you just get a group of your friends like from uni and get going to them because there's goodie bags, there's alcohol, there's <laughs> all the good stuff. So get on it, absolutely, and Definitely. just the people that you meet there as well as. Like, I honestly wouldn't have got the job at Phillips with Conwell if I wasn't networking that night. So it's just a really great example of getting yourself out there and talking to as many people as you can. Definitely. Definitely. I think that's wise advice. What about yourself, Angus? Um, well, my definition of networking is part of what Lexi has touched on, but it's also not just about... I know not everyone is comfortable going to networking events regularly. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I don't have any issue doing that, but I know a lot of my friends don't go to them because there's too many people there and it can be a bit intimidating when you're put in a room with all of these strange people who you've ne never met before. Definitely. And so part of networking for me is actually just keeping in contact with 
everyone that you have met during your studies and any work that you do, keep in contact with your past tutors, your past lecturers at QUT and UQ, whatever university you're going to, keep in contact with them and also friends. Don't finish uni or, you know, not make, try and make friends at uni and build strong relationships because later in your career, those people are going to be your peers yeah. and every single one of them will have opportunities, even if it's small or big, it doesn't matter what it is, it's building meaningful connections with people that are long lasting. I think is that's what networking is to me. Yeah. It doesn't matter what way you go about that, whether it's in big events, small events, one-on-one, -on -one, it's just about meaningful connections. No doubt. I think that's very similar to my definition as well because it, during uni for some reason I had this obsession to collect business cards. Honestly don't know why. Even looking back I, I think it just I think it was just an OCD hobby. But um, <laughs> by the time I finished uni I actually had about three, four hundred business cards from just lecturers, you, uh, you know, guest lecturers, some friends who work in firms, their uncles and aunties or whoever, right? But that all of a sudden gave a place to start mm -hmm. and just to, you know, pick up the phone and call some people to catch up with a, for a coffee, not to ask for a job. Yeah. And this is what I, I um, all the time tell my students as well. It's about the relationship. It's not about, you know, networking, going to these events if you're not actually developing mm -hmm. the relationships. So it's making sure you need to put yourself out there 100% of the time, but how you actually do it. There's so many students who go to these networking events but get no results because they're having no meaningful relationships built from it. There's no follow-up. There's no, there's no reason for someone to remember your face and name because you're not giving them a reason. Not, not because you don't have one. Yeah. It's about making sure that you do. But that's really cool. And how long did it take for you to enter the, enter the industry? Uh, well, f both when I finished my bachelor and my masters, I had a job lined up before I finished mm -hmm. um, both of those positions. I started applying for positions in my bachelor halfway through my fourth year, okay. and I, the entire second semester of fourth year, I was applying for jobs. And so okay, I, so you were very proactive. <laughs> yeah, very proactive. I did like a round of ten applications, and I'd call them all a week later and say, hey, did you get my application? And then... Again, 10 more applications. I just re repeated that process until in the end, mm -hmm. I think it was a month before I finished, um, I had the position at FAB. And then with um, Ferry of O'Day, it was a little bit different because I wasn't applying yet. Mm -hmm. I just got a call out of the blue, I called up for Scott for a coffee mm -hmm. because he wanted to tell me that you know he was starting to take over Ferry of O'Day. Like they've been around since 1957, a very long history of a family business. So he's the third generation. He's not a family member, but he has worked with them mm -hmm. a lot previously. And yeah. So he just wanted to tell me. And then it came out of that. We just kept catching up a couple more times for coffee. Yeah. Yeah. And then there I was at the end of the, immediately after submitting my assignment, three days later, I was in the office working full time. Perfect. There you go. This is before. And <laughs> I, I wanted to touch base on what Alexis said before about not getting disheartened. Yeah. What was your experience? How did you keep your spirits up? I think just uh, seeing friends and because it was I think in the end it was quite hard when everyone else is working full time and then you're not having a job as well especially coming home and then just being at home all day every day and not having money to do anything with that free time like it's not even like it's a holiday Yeah. yeah. Um, but I was constantly catching up with my mum and she's very positive and like she was like it's okay it's okay like Something will come out of it, just do it, keep doing what you're doing. Like, and she's a very um, intuitive woman, so she's very positive and like sees things in the end picture. And she's like, you're too, you're too creative, you're too excited, you're too all of the above, like for you to be disheartened. Just, like, just get yourself out there, and and it worked. Yeah, it's about the support. Absolutely. Like everyone, that's the same thing about networking. You get your network of friends together, and one and when one of you falls on harder times, yep. everyone bands together. And even if you yeah. don't, that person doesn't get a job from any of them. You're all there to help motivate that person to keep cracking away at it. You know, there's something at the end of the tunnel. Yep. And you're gonna do great things once you crack it. Yeah, no, I, I love that because at the end of the day, you only need one yes. Yep. Right. And if, as long as you don't give up, so I love that you have that mentality and you kept that going and found your own way to keep your spirits up because it's very hard to, I think, do it intrinsically and that to get that one yes, where's the line? Everyone has a line and this is one of my mentors actually had 
I think it was from memory 146 applications when he first moved to Australia with a little child. I think it was, yeah, I think the, she's my age now, but she was about, I think, a year or two old. And zero friends in Australia, zero family, starting from scratch and a couple of grand of money. And they had, we went through 146 applications and he's in a really high up position in, at Emirates now. And I remember him saying, going, I still have that stack of applications just to ground you and to remind you where you came from. And he just kept saying, you just, you just keep going, you just keep going. So 30 doesn't seem so bad now when you, you yeah. hear about yeah. 146. One of the things I wanted to understand, especially from Alexis, was was it different, do you think, for you to enter the industry as a female? And looking at you know your male friends, do you think there's any difference from that? Not that I've seen, absolutely not. I think we are uh, emerging architects are really coming into a really positive uh, place in the world at the moment in Australia, just in terms of architecture. Like, mm -hmm. like it's not even just architecture; females are coming up in high positions. Like, obviously, it's a long time coming, but yeah. I think we were at the start of something great. And then there's so many female architects and designers that that own their own firms around Brisbane, and it's incredible. Yeah. So. I don't think that I, I haven't seen on my point of view. Yeah. I've had a pretty positive experience. That's good. That's good. What about yourself, Angus? Do you have any comments on that? I think I do. Um, I would say that for my female peers, I haven't seen as much of a difference mm -hmm. in you know how challenging it is to get into the industry. But I think that the industry as a whole has a way to come. And that is in its ability to retain female architects and designers. Mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, women are always going to be people who bear children. Mm -hmm. And that certainly puts a big impact on their professional life. It happened to my mother. It's happened to almost every one of my friend's mothers. And yep. that is part of life. Mm -hmm. But I think the, what the industry can do better is support women a lot more strongly through those phases of their life and provide not just pathways into the industry at the end of study, mm -hmm. but provide pathways to return to industry after having children or having a certain amount of time off. Because realistically, the world is, you know, half of us are men, half of us are women, or somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. We need people representing all parts of society, designing our world, um, for it to truly work. And so if we only have, you know, 80% of architects over the age of 40 being men, well, then everything's not going to be suitable for the rest of the population. Yep. No, that's, I think, very valuable. What about if you are not from a Caucasian background, different races? Do you see any differences in there when you're entering this group? Just from your own point of view. From my point of view, no. Um, I mean, um, for me, a lot of my friends who aren't Caucasian are Australian in all senses of the word. Were, they were either born in Australia mm -hmm. or they moved here at a very young age. Um, I don't think it has held them back in any way, and I don't think there's any prejudice in um, in the industry, especially in, in Brisbane. There's none that I can mm -hmm. really put a finger to. Mm -hmm. um, my colleague at the moment, she's an Argentinian graduate, yeah. and... And she had trouble breaking into the industry in the same way that anyone would mo moving to a foreign country. Mm -hmm. But once she's in the industry now, working at FBA, you know the opportunities are equal. She is working towards having her degree recognised in Australia mm -hmm. and then becoming registered. Yep. And there's no hurdle that is put there just because she's from a different place or has a different qualification. It's just you're in that position as a graduate and everything that you need to make the world your oyster is right there. The same as, as it is for me and the same as it is for Lexi, yeah. which I think is really great. And I think most practices in, in Brisbane and Australia are like that. Yeah, awesome. What about you, your thoughts, Lexi? Uh, similar point of view to Angus with a few. Um, I don't know one of my mates that, um, Phil Smith Conwell uh, from India, and he's just very passionate and he's so willing to work. And mm -hmm. I just think that shines through 
it's the passion and the willingness to work. I just think that that shines through to becoming employed. I think. It's yeah, I think that's interesting because when I've gone through my own personal experience, has been different. Until you had a face to your name, when people actually see just the name, there is a little bit of a bias con uh, misconception. I think that happens even at a subconscious level. But when that person's name is involved with a face or, or their skill sets or portfolio or something like that, that changes all of a sudden and then so, yeah. what you're saying it comes through. So it's actually quite interesting and I love that students, I want students to be able to be mindful of that and come around it because I know there's Asian students that actually have a Caucasian name just to overcome that hurdle. Yeah. But um, other cultures do things different. So it's, it's actually a very interesting dynamic. and. What do you think are some other challenges and obstacles that you've seen through your own experience, through you know, your peers, your friends, that entering the industry has either delayed it or made it more difficult to enter the industry? Have you seen any other obstacles and challenges? I've seen during uni, a few people would say, I'm not going to get a job until I complete my master's. Mm -hmm. I did that. <laughs> yeah. But would you consider that as a hurdle towards now or well I have to no, be honest I think 400 business cards <laughs> <laughs> touche um, no it's I did that because the market was really bad at the time and so you're focusing on your studies I ideally would have wanted to enter the industry before doing masters because that was the recommendation I got from my lecturers as well but it just there hardly was any jobs at the time it was in a downturn so I didn't want to waste time I didn't look at travel at that time as a positive thing like you did Angus I think yeah. looking back maybe I would have considered that option but um, so I just went straight into it and I don't regret the decision but I think it would have made masters a hell of a lot more of a learning experience much easier aligning that with your industry experience so it, Bit of, bit of, bit of, a uh, little bit of everything actually. So, what about yourself? Do you see any other hurdles or obstacles or anything that you see with, within your? It's kind of hard to put your finger on. I think that the biggest obstacle people have is still just you know prejudice about personality types. We have <laughs> so like you go so you get an interview, mm. you have an excellent portfolio, a really great resume, you've done this and that, which is what you want yep. to have at the end of your bachelor and your masters if you do one, that's what you want to have. Then you get to the interview and then I think there's still I don't want to sound discriminatory, but in older generations of architects, there's still a stigma around people with the wrong personality type. Mm -hmm. And I understand that people want someone who will fit into their team, yep. but a team really should be able to take in all personality types and make them fit the bill. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, like, we have a friend who's quite shy and he has that had that count against him. He's brilliant. Mm -hmm. He's really friendly. Um, really, really kind, and he's just an excellent designer. But because he's quite shy, people overlook him a lot, and I think that is wrong because he's the kind of person in an office that you want. They're not going to be disruptive. They're going to do the work, and they're going to be really, really good at it. So, I mean, I don't know what the solution to that is. I think it is us in the industry coming through and learning from those mistakes and being more flexible and adaptable to different types of people because you want them. In yeah, industry. They're really, really important. That's the thing, and I think it's it, that's one of the biggest challenges that I see as well. When students consider themselves shy, it takes a long time and a lot of push and effort and energy just to get yourself out there to one networking event yeah. <laughs> and talk to you know two people. And it actually is. And one of my one of the ways that I advise is I always ask them, "When did you define yourself as a shy person?" <laughs> You know, it's it's we have this inherent need to live by how we define ourselves. Exactly, yeah. So if you define yourself as a shy person, then how do you get yourself out there? Yeah. You actually have to break that mold and change that mindset. So a lot of people consider me as an extrovert. Would you guys agree? Yes. I'm not. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Somewhere in, in between. Yeah, it's in, all fluid. Exactly right. And in that scale from extrovert to introvert we're always on somewhere on, on that scale yeah. I'm just on that introvert line mm -hmm. so it's it's a matter of actually changing that mindset and 
physically do what you did, Alexis, and actually push yourself out there, get your face out there, talk to people, and then it gets easy. Yeah. I think that's what I actually found because I was I was pretty shy. Like, I think I, in terms of I was I thought I wasn't good enough, and but it wasn't probably until it took me a long time, like a long time, to really like work out like what I wanted to get out of the industry. But I I, I surround myself with positive and like mm. cheerful people, and I think that kind of just depends obviously on your personality type. But I would actually really like to do that personality test. I think I've changed because I'm considered yeah. an introvert mm-hmm. um, from that personality test. But I think over time and the experience that I've gotten and meeting the people, I've, I think I've completely changed since yeah. finishing my degree. It totally yeah. changes over the course of your life and your career. All of it, like everything about us as humans is fluid. It mm-hmm. changes depending on the situation you're in. And I think overcoming shyness for an example is practice like everything makes perfect if you force yourself to do it a couple of times every time you do it it becomes easier and it's the same for me if i'm doing something that i feel very uncomfortable doing like writing a spes <laughs> hate writing spesses yep. every time i do it i will slowly become more confident and i'll be able to do it That's freely right. but at the moment i'm not there <laughs> yeah look, and then the personality test myers rick there's a there's a couple of different really good ones. The Myers-Briggs give, gives you four different letters that represents different parts of your personality. And if you actually look at what those words, what those uh, letters stand for, the four different personality types, we actually have every single one of those qualities. Yeah. And when you do more research about the Myers-Briggs, it actually tells you, you develop your fourth, ver- fourth attribute by age 40. Wow. So. Given our age, yeah. we've only we're actually just finishing to develop the second version of it. The third one comes through our thirties. The fourth one comes through our forties, uh, and this is when midlife crisis happens because all of a sudden you've entered and been doing a job for twenty years, and then now you have a different personality type, and it feels different. Yeah. Yeah. So you think something's wrong, and people call it a crisis. But this is where then people go and buy a ridiculously expensive motorcycle or something like that and do something crazy. But um, instead, it's actually recognizing that it's your personality evolving, like you just yeah. said. And so it's okay to have different you know, personality types. It's about how you engage the, those different parts of yourself. So I'm so happy to hear that you guys are recognizing that at such an early age. I definitely didn't. So that's pretty cool. What's your advice? for students that are listening now, teachers that have students that they should be coaching, looking at coming into the tertiary. As design students, what are your learnings in terms of, you know, going through your tertiary experience and then entering the industry? What would you do? What would you avoid? I think studying really hard is very important, Mm -hmm. but you need to take time out for yourself. Like, otherwise you're just not going to get there in the end and you kick yourself and but go for a walk and go out with your friends and don't, like there's so many nights that I would just stay and stay and stay and yeah. I look back on it now and I'm like, oh, I could have actually enjoyed uni a lot more and I could have mm-hmm. been a part of the lifestyle and because I never, I was never a part of any clubs or, I see. and I look back on it now and I'm like, that could have been the greatest advantage for mm-hmm. me. Um, yeah. But get a group of friends and you can do anything and do it together and it's not so scary. And it plays into what you said before of, building those relationships and networking. Absolutely. Good advice. What about yourself, Angus? Yeah, I think collaboration is important, like Lexi said. And on top of that, collaborating to develop yourself and your peers is crucial. Mm -hmm. Develop yourself not only from the perspective of uni, these are my studies, let's tick some boxes, get some good grades and finish and get a sweet job. Develop your other interests. So for me, I'm interested, I have... A lot of interests, probably too many. <laughs> my girlfriend would definitely say I have too many hobbies. Um, but to name a few of them, I love mountain biking. I love brewing beer. Yeah. I wow. yeah. I like um. I like gardening. Mm-hmm. Um, all of those things. Taking time off from doing architectural work and doing those hobbies allows your brain time to develop in different ways of thinking. And language is a good example, like Lexi doing Japanese, I've studied um, German to quite a high level. All of those extra little things that you do outside of design Mm -hmm. help you to be more focused and design better because you understand the world from a different perspective. I mean, I'm not saying 
going down a hill on a mountain bike is going to make you have an epiphany and <laughs> some amazing you may. thing. It, you might, and then you might fall off. But I think I can start that a couple of times. Yeah, <laughs> so many times. But developing those things allows you really to push yourself forward. And you're your biggest advocate. If you advocate for yourself and also push yourself into other things, ultimately you'll come out the other end of your design studies smarter, better, you know, more empathetic. Um, you'll just understand the world better yep. than you ever could imagine and, and always keep growing. Yeah, I think that's, I love that advice. Both of you actually have shared some really good things that come, has come from your experience. But um, one of the things that you mentioned was the word empathy, and I love that. And this is one of my fortes being design thinking. It, it's one of the primary fundamental values of it. And those hobbies, it's what makes you unique. It's yeah. the whether the, you have 150 hobbies or if you have one and you like languages or if you like going and you know taking long walks, it really doesn't matter because everyone's going to come out of the university system in a tertiary level with the same degree yeah. and you have a slight customization with the minor that you do or the major. And again, you're still in a classroom with about you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, sometimes 150 people. Mm -hmm. So what differentiates you from a com company's point of view is those little things. Yeah. Whether it's photography, whether it's you know, mountain biking, whether it's long walks, it really doesn't matter. But it adds to who you are. And when you actually capitalize on those things, you then become a unique designer and then you start to think and develop yourself more. I think the biggest trap is people do that by accident, but when you do it mindfully and having awareness of it, you double, triple your results and all of a sudden that luck yeah. gets done more and more and you have more luck as yeah. you go. Yeah. So I love that. So thanks so much guys and uh, it's been it's been a brilliant I think episode and a lot of teachers and, and students listening will get a lot from your experience. And uh, I would definitely recommend hitting up Angus and Alexis on Facebook or email. Yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn. Yep, yeah, there you go. Connect with them on, on those platforms and talk to them about their experience. If you're shy, get yourself out there, message them. Yeah, and yeah I'm more than happy to come yeah. with you. Yeah, we'll, we'll have coffee. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. We there love you coffee go. too. Yeah. <laughs> or, <laughs> or a beer. Or, or, beer. <laughs> or a beer. And actually, before we leave, I've never been able to get a job through an interview and by applying the normal way. Mm -hmm. Every yeah. single job has been Access. from networking and yeah. one of them, one of the main jobs that I still have is working in fiber operations and that was actually found while I was stretching before an indoor cricket game. Wow. Yeah. So it, it just happened, right? So, yeah. But it's through that developer relationship because of that friend, now friend of mine, back then wasn't. So it's, it just builds on from there. So. That's, what, that's it for today, folks. So jump online, check out the past episode and the show notes with the bio of these two and messages, uh, links to their platforms. So it's rashansanarika.com slash podcast. And till next time, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you.